I mentioned in the introduction, over the past year, you've been leading efforts to build Intel's programmatic solution. Um, first of all, tell us a little bit about what goes into that decision of what you build in-house versus what you rely on partners for, and kind of what has made Intel ripe for the work that you've been doing. Yeah, so I'll start to talk a little bit about, um, yesterday we were talking about culture, and Intel is often associated with Moore's Law. It was, Gordon Moore was one of our founders, and 50 years ago he wrote Moore's Law. It has a technical component, which is, you know, some processors will get faster and smaller over time, but there's a philosophical element behind it, and that is what has been done can be outdone. It's really elegant and simple, what has been done can be outdone, and we take that to heart in many ways. And so we were looking at our programmatic solution, and we were thinking about how it could get stronger. And we wanted it to get stronger because we wanted uh, greater transparency. Yes, in cost, but also in just the tactics that we were using, whether it was retargeting or the types of data sources and inventory. We wanted to be able to own the data. And we wanted to start to build some institutionalized knowledge in this space. Um, and we felt like that was important for us as a company. So we set out to speak to a variety of companies. We spoke to DSPs. We spoke to programmatic service specialty companies as well as our trading desk, um, to start to kind of lay that out and landed at a place where we will contract directly with DSPs and we will eventually get to the point where we want to bring the service side of this in-house. Okay, great. Um, so you've been through this experience. A lot of brands have not, but they're starting to ask the questions. What's your recommendation to other brands? Do you think this is right for all brands? I think um, some of the brands are, do, are early adopters right now in this space, so I don't know that it's right for every brand. For us, it was right because brands that seem to have some kind of technology component or a heavy engineering kind of based culture, that makes sense. And we have that as part of the Intel values, and particularly the team I'm on. I sit on a digital marketing and then paid media team overall. We have this belief of the scientific application of data to inform business and marketing outcomes. And so because of that, we said, it's right for us. But I think you know, brands have to answer that question for themselves as to whether it's right for them. So can I ask, um, we talked a little bit about this, the structure of Intel. Does it make a difference if you have a culture of things being centralized versus federated? Because you know, within the Coca-Cola system, very federated, right? Brand Coke in Germany is responsible for their numbers. Uh, they get the media budget they need to do that. So how, how, can you, how would you counsel companies who are exploring this in terms of, you know, is the culture even, not, not so organizationally, you know, not, not in terms yeah. of. I, we talked about this, is this notion of specialized and therefore deep subject matter expertise versus maybe generalist, but rising all boats. We talked a little bit about that yesterday in the brand session, and I, I think it's going to be a topic that comes up again today. Um, for us, we are a heavily centralized marketing organization, but that said, there are business units, we, we're in service of the business units, but the business units also do a lot of activity that, that, that's out there. And it's no surprise that with a new CMO, he's exactly taking a look at that right now. Um, but from this case, that we're, what we're talking about is um, more of a centralized type of solution. Yeah, that's an important point. Um, so uh, having gone through this process, Tell us a little bit about what you've learned, um, specifically some questions around, you must have gone through an in-depth evaluation around DSPs. Are they all created equal? Are there differences? Um, you know, what is the right service model? What is the role of agencies if they have a role? And I know that's going to be different for each client, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on some of these steps that you've gone through, some of the decisions that you've made, yeah. and hear your experience. I, you know, I, I was new to this space, too, I, in, in this type of depth, so I learned a lot, and um, there was a team of us, and I think we learned a couple things. So when it comes to the tech side on the DSPs, um, and I know we have DSPs here, so from, a, from our perspective, it was like, well, I'd say 90% of it feels the same. There's some of them have more elegant user, user interface than others, but the 10% is a, is a big deal, because the 10% is different capabilities or access to inventory, so it really helped reinforce there is no one DSP fits all type solution. You're gonna, depending on your objectives, go to different ones. On the service side, I had no idea that there were so many different service models. Yes, there's the agency trading desk, and yes, we can build it in-house, but there are specialty, not associated with big holding company agencies who really dig into this space, and there are managed service sides on the, the DSP. So 
Um, back to that point about the, the, the big learning, I think, though, is the, um, okay, you've got the specialty versus the generalist. One of the things that I learned was I was really impressed with those specialty programmatic agencies. They are experts. They had interesting tools. You know, the people, a process. It was like, wow, really interesting. And so do you go that route and have yet another agency over here that you have to integrate into the bigger picture? Or do you go maybe the route, and I'm going to generalize for a second because I know trading desks are in an interesting space and, and I'm not, I may not, when I generalize, uh, capture everything. But in theory, a trading desk is connected into, and sometimes is directly, it's not even the names, they're, they're pulling them in to the rest of your media group. And in theory, you're going to have better integration there. So it kind of you know, became apparent, and I think that's a conversation when companies find religion in a space, years ago digital, today programmatic, you know, today mobile, you know, how they choose to, to find the time. And sometimes it might be good for the specialists, and sometimes there might be times when it's um, the generalist route is better. So how does Intel view the role of programmatic in campaigns? And I ask the question because there's often a lot of debate, or I would say pre preconceived notions that programmatic is better for DR. Um, and I know you've gone through a lot and can speak to the role of programmatic beyond that. Yeah, we don't think, we don't actually put programmatic in a DR bucket only. We are um, interested in using it for our brand campaigns. but. I want, I'm going to switch that up a little bit. How does Intel think about the role of data? I want to talk about that for a second because um, I think data, everything around this, it's the marketing challenge of our time. So I don't have a lack of data, but access to the right data to pull the right kind of insights to inform what I'm trying to do from a marketing and a business perspective is the marketing challenge of our time. And we know at Intel, we've learned a lot in this space, but we also know we have a lot more to learn. Um, and I would love to, because I feel like that's one of those statements of like, all right, well, you know, access to data to drive business outcomes, that's a pretty lofty statement. So if you guys will indulge me for a second, I would love to give an example of what the heck are you talking about when you say that? Um, and maybe educate people a little bit about Intel and what we're, we're trying to do. So Intel as a company is, in, is transforming. And yes, we make chips that go into laptops and PCs and things, and we also we want to protect that business, and we also have chips in the data center, and that's growing. Because every time someone talks about the connected coffee maker and connected underwear, we're like, woo, that's to the data center, and that, that's a good thing for us. There's not connected underwear, but I'm sure it's going to come out there. <laughs> so we want to kind of protect and grow in that space, but we're also trying to transform, like many companies, into Internet of Things and wearables. And our approach for wearables is we think about partnerships. So we've announced, you may have heard Intel has a partnership with Opening Ceremony, the fashion brand. They sell it at Barney's, and it's one of the more fashion-forward wearable accessories. When we announced um, we have a partnership with Google and Tag Heuer for our version of a smartwatch that's coming out. So we think about the kind of partnerships that make sense. So programmatic and media data gives me the opportunity to get atomic level customer insights, and I could take those insights and talk to the teams who are thinking about the partnership roadmaps, and it might actually influence the direction that they go and what they do. And they're going to talk to marketing research. We have that, and we look at our audiences, and we know that too. But what I can offer from a media perspective is these atomic level insights, and that for me is like an example that says we all want media to be a strategic value to the business. That for me is an example of that. Unscripted question. I told him not to do the unscripted <laughs> question. Um, do, you, do you sense or foresee, or, or how do you foresee discussions on the creative development side? Right? Is, mm. is there any risk of this becoming too much about the numbers? Is there a, a smart thing that can be done early yeah. on process-wise? Uh, that, that is a great question. I, you know, I, this has been said, and I believe it. If, if you future forward project, I'd say we're going to be going down two routes. You will have the very efficient programmatic kind of buying route, and it will be across multiple channels that are not today. And then you're going to have those opportunities that are the really custom kind of, you know, brands and agencies and salespeople get together, and they really kind of think about those experiences, and it's custom, high-touch, creative. Hopefully it has, you know, greater um, effectiveness. 
And so the creative solutions for those are very different because that's where I think the, on the custom stuff we'll still continue to see really interesting breakthrough, um, kind of touch you, touch your heart, not just your eyeball. But on the programmatic side, what I, I know we need to get to, and we're trying to think about this and get to it faster, is, okay, so if I've got all these micro audiences that I can get at and test and look at, I want to put some, the right kind of creative messaging by whatever signals I'm hearing, whatever behavioral intent signals. And you can't, you can't manually do that, right? right. I gotta get a, to a dynamic, some kind of dynamic solution that's gonna help me do that. Creation. For the content okay. creation. If, if we're really gonna start to, I think, see that chugging. Right. So the domino that starts tipping over is, you know, okay, then you got the legal reviews and the brand approvals yeah. and things like that. The whole machine around all of that really hadn't been invented yet. And a creative team that goes from, hey, I need this big idea, to like, I need it, it has to be centered and grounded in a big idea and some insights, but what I need is a lot of headlines, a lot of images, and a lot of this, and a lot of that. Like, that's, for a creative agency, that's an so interesting thing to get your So I'm gonna stay off script for one more question. Um, the content piece is the part that we are most excited about. Uh, and it's the most critical of the experience. You can have the best inventory, you can have the best targeting. If you don't have the right creative, you're overpaying for inventory because you're not taking advantage of what you're getting. Who do you think is best poised to solve that? Is it going to be creative agencies? Is it going to be media agencies with content capabilities? Is it a third party that is rising up in the startup world? From your experience, any any thoughts, or where would you like to see it come from? Who's going to be delivering the best, the best creative? dynamic creative? The best dynamic creative. Um, well, I, creative. Sometimes I hear the phrases. Um, you know, we, usually when you hear the media or the um, agency AOR model is dead, I I tend to interpret that as maybe not necessarily in the media space and maybe in the creative space where it used to be, where you'd have this lead creative agency. Um, and then they would create an idea and maybe there's some other agencies, you know, a social agency or a search agency and they thought about that um, overall. But so I think part of the reason people say oh, that AOR model is dead is because, uh, yes, creative agencies are still a great place to get amazing content. And we're starting to see more and more um, brands. And you, we've always talked to brands for custom content. But um, we had the other day as, as a pitch Complex Media came in and the founder, and he said, in one week, he kind of said, I got to know Intel, and I put together, and he put together kind of his version of a brief that was surprisingly right on target. We had not briefed him about anything of what we were trying to do. He really kind of understood the gist of where we are and the brand problems we have and what we're trying to do next, and put together kind of solutions that were, yes, they had to do with complex media, but they had to do with experiential. And he was like, oh, and by the way, you should redo your packaging, and he talked about that. So to me, it just reinforced that, um, Publishers, you know, are continuing their efforts in their ability to provide creative yeah. solutions. And yes, creative agencies are continuing to provide um, interesting solutions in that space too. But there's a variety sure. of things in there. So I, I wonder if there isn't something in the um, lessons to be learned in the sort of social war room, sort of real-time content creation mm -hmm. that begins to inform the content question, right? So yeah. if you have teams internally, you know, prepared to respond to something going on in a social context, who can create content and have all those routines set up, married up with informed in-house people who are really understanding all the, the media side of that. I wonder if that isn't a one plus one equals three. Definitely. Thing. Yeah. And in, and since you know we were kind of talking about programmatic and in programmatic it's definitely it's the real time for that but in programmatic it's kind of signals and intent so um, one of the one of the things people talk about is well, what about the role of mobile for programmatic and um, I would say talking about mobile for pro programmatic is navel gazing and it's missing the big picture now I'm going to look and see if you guys are bringing out your pitchforks and your torches yet. <laughs> so, no, so let me explain. Um, in that space, uh, what, and again, it's just the programmatic filter. What I care about in that space is audiences. And so what I care about is um, finding them either one of two ways. Either I can't, I know them, and I want to retarget them, and I want to have this interesting uh, conversation across channels and more and more soon 
particularly across devices. And I want to think about you know, where they are in the customer journey and the signals they're sending me so I can get the right creative message to them. Um, and then on the other side, their programmatic allows me to discover audiences and segments I didn't even know were valuable to me. And what, I'm, what might I say to those? So a lot of folks, you know, I know there's sellers and agencies in the rooms and brands and things. For those who are selling mobile, I guess I would say, you know, when I think about as mobile is a big deal, we, we get that. Some tipping, interesting tipping points, and no one would argue there isn't a stat that doesn't say, phew, skyrocketing, skyrocketing. But programmatic is a big deal, too, and everything is skyrocketing, skyrocketing there. So as they come together, I would say, um, think about how, if you're a seller, how you can help me with one of those two audiences. And think about when it comes to programmatic, it's going to be less about device, and it's just going to be more about you know, what you're bringing to the table with audiences overall. Yeah. So as we focus the discussion around mobile, we, we talked this morning about how mobile offers unique capabilities and therefore unique data, such as location. Tell us a little bit about how mobile's unique data plays into the overall role of programmatic or the pr prioritization of mobile and programmatic. I am really interested in location data and to see what it's going to deliver, particularly as a means of attribution, um, because I have a particular challenge with our business, which is I don't sell stuff to consumers, right? I sell to OEMs and big businesses. And so because I don't do that, when it comes to my digital media, I'm missing all that piece at the end that says, here's how I can tell you know, to optimize to conversion and things like that. So my digital measurement framework has to be things like, um, you know, sometimes, and it depends, sometimes it is, um, if it is we're trying to push people to intel.com, it's like, oh, well, they did things that indicated that they were going to purchase, and maybe they went on to an OEM. Or if it is um, engaging with content offsite, it might be about, you know, if it's long format, how long did they engage? And then, of course, if it's like, we, sometimes we push to re retailers, and don't get me started there, that's another big black hole. So we have kind of, we are really trying to get to that last point of understanding how that advertising connection is with um, purchase. And so that's where we're interested in location um, a lot. But I, I still am saying location is one intent for me, because walking into a Best Buy doesn't, for me, indicate purchase, right? And I know we're going to get to the point, and we are, but they're standing in the computer aisle in Best Buy. How, isn't that great? So that's going to get better um, overall. But yeah, I need to think about a variety of the signals um, that, and particularly with programmatic, that behaviors and habits and intent, you know, and how to like st stitch that all together and stitch it together across devices, you know, is what we're really trying to we're really interested in. Yeah, I love that notion of stitching it all together because that really is what we're having to do at this point is there's data here, data there, data internally, and how do you pull those pieces together, and then how do you stitch together the creative and the experience that go around that. Okay. Um, so, Tom, I won't put you on the spot and involve you in this question, um, but Julie, uh, there are a lot of big media reviews happening right now. Intel is not one of them. Um, so I'd love your perspective just from the sidelines of what do you, if you were to speculate, what do you think might be behind some of the, the, the motivations and, and some of the, the trends that we're seeing with regards to media reviews and what clients might be seeking out of that? Yeah, um, I have some theories, and then Tom, you, you, you can talk later and tell me if you think this is right or not. Um, and we stay, we are connected to various brands and have conversations separately, so I haven't had a chance to you know, talk to any of them that are in this space, but here's some of my theories. Um, just as I talked about uh, data and everything around it is the marketing challenge of our time, I believe we're at a tipping point where you know, maybe not all brands, but a lot of brands are looking and deciding, okay, I want to make sure I have an agency who knows how to use this as a strategic advantage for me. Because it used to be a number of years ago you know, that you'd say, your agency is getting the best rates for you, that is a strategic advantage. Mm -hmm. And I think we're moving to where the application of data to drive my business is becoming a strategic advantage. So agencies or th uh, brands are thinking about um, who's the agency for me for the next five years in that space? Um, I, I think that, I would guess, would be a big driver across the board. And then I don't think, I think transparency is going to come up. I don't think it's a driver necessarily, but I can't imagine with the conversations that it's not going to be something that brands are going to ask agencies about. Um, we have all heard and we all know that margins are 
lowering over time with agencies. And so as that's happening, the notion, if you read the press, is, well, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of fees that are on media margins outside of that and that are not disclosed. So it's not like an AVB where it's a clear thing. It's, it's cash at high, high levels or it's ki inventory kickback, whatever that is. Uh, so if you read the press, you think, oh, yeah, it's, it's going on out there. So I think brands will probably use this as an opportunity to try to get a better handle on is this happening and how can we put some you know, transparency metrics in place just to understand the bigger picture. Yeah, so it's a combination of strategy and the agency that has the ability to use these tools strategically in addition to the transparency. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm interested to get, a, to get a sense from other brands in the room of you know, what they think about that as yeah. we discussed today. Yeah. Uh, so with the little bit of time we have left, um, let's turn it to a, a little more lighthearted topic. What are some of the things that you're seeing out there, whether it be trends or new technologies that maybe you don't have the answer to, but you and Intel are watching because you think they may pose interesting opportunities down the road? Yeah, in, um, some of the things that we're pretty interested in kind of help us think more about how to be a brand as a publisher. So um, we, we do that, and, and so we feel good about the space we are in as Intel as a brand as a publisher, and we try to publish higher level kind of interesting things. It's not like, how do I sell a two-in-one through native content? It's about how do I introduce people to Intel and have a relationship at a different level? And so since we do that, we have uh, digital platforms, and we push those things out in our social content, and um, that exists. So we're seeing things like Meerkat and Periscope come up, and we're sort of starting to, we don't have the answer yet, but we're starting to think about, interesting, interesting. What's that gonna mean for us? Uh, or we're seeing things like um, Facebook instant articles come around, and we go, okay, that's interesting. How, you know, is there a role for sponsored content, and, and uh, not just an ad unit, but like a larger kind of conversation, can we get together with BuzzFeed, and, and how's that gonna work? So I think it's, it's from an advertising perspective that's interesting, but it's going to help us as we think of brand as a publisher to expand and start to create more channels that make sense and not just feel like it kind of lives in our um, digital space or maybe you know in our social platforms, but actually starting to be to, to find those places to get it get it out more. Yeah, and to take it back to the discussion that started yesterday and has continued today around culture. Um, how do you think Intel's culture will play into how and when you decide what technologies to start to use or test or, or what will be the strategy around that that ties back to, or I should say that the culture enables? Yeah. Um, the digital marketing group that I sit on is, a, um, is an early adopter culture. And yesterday, I was thinking about when we had the conversation yesterday with brands is, um, risk and how you take on risk or not. And a lot of times when you say the word risk, people sort of tend to think of it as go with your gut and just go with it. And we don't do a lot of that, but what we do is we believe in um, rapid tests and learns as a way of, you know, kind of trying new things and getting out there, mitigating the risk a little bit so it's not just coming from the gut. So, you know, I talked about the scientific application of data. So yeah. we are totally open to trying a lot of new areas and we just kind of build it into a test and learn environment and hopefully try to think about, great, what did we learn and, and should we scale this now to a bigger thing? We use this phrase, uh, test and fail to learn and scale, yeah. right? So you, yeah. you gotta accept that there's gonna be some element of failure yeah. before you can find out the right mix of all this stuff to make it really work. But we're having conversations too, but in our, in our with a new CMO, you know, if, if that's the notion, um, learning is the success. And so you have to be, as a company, you have to start to, we talked about celebrating failures. Uh, like, not celebrating failures, but celebrating, what did you do? Oh, it didn't work, but what did you learn from it? You know, and feeling comfortable that you can have that kind of, you can do those kind of things, because a lot of companies, celebrating failure is, is not something that is innate to kind of what they're trying right. to do. Right, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we have a little bit of time left. Do we open it to questions? Sure. sure. Okay. They're all being very shy. Oh. Uh, first of all, thank you all for your um, thoughtful comments today. David Short, Proven Los Angeles. Um, my question really is for both of you. Um, or. Angela, feel free to answer too. But um, when you talk about pub when you talk about 
brand as publisher. Obviously, Coke's made that their homepage. Is Intel going to go to the extreme, if you will, of um, in- entertaining content, or is it really going to be thought leadership focused? Uh, we've been having a lot of conversations about what's the right space for us, and we don't tend to, at this time, we don't tend to kind of go away, um, and we, we still, it's rooted in technology. So, for example, there was a product recently that's was launched in Q4 and in Q1, um, Intel RealSense, and it was an enabling product in devices like tablets that really allowed for like a 3D component in pictures. And so the way, on the brand as publisher side, the way we didn't we talked about it was not, hey, this new Dell device has this, and you can do this and this and that. What we talked about is, how does 3D work in the brain, and what's the science behind 3D? So it was kind of a loftier kind of conversation, but it still made sense, I guess, to the authentic Intel voice that you would want to get out there um, overall. So one of the, um, and one of the things we'll probably move into next as we think about rebranding Intel is, um, some of the experiences we help bring to life because we are a component inside that really does help to bring a lot of experiences outside. So we're trying to bring the Intel inside out. And I think as we think about experiences, you know, we will probably go down a direction of, you know, what are the experiences that Intel helps to offer you? And that's gonna be a richer space. I've got a question. Um, as you think about the implementation of a programmatic culture, for lack of a better term, right? So there's a, an ingrained capability, you've embraced it. Um, what does that curve look like? Does, does, does the curve begin to flatten out where you're, it's done, it's integrated, it's a routine part of what we're doing, and now it's about incremental gains? Uh, does the curve 45 degrees for the rest of time, it's never done, right? You're always learning something new, or if it flattens, is it flattened in a year, in six months, or is it well, we are, um, I will tell you as we go through it, because we are really in early days that we know where we want the end game to be, and we are just beginning to kind of decide the, mat, the path to be able to get there. But just knowing the nature of um, programmatic, and obviously our consumers and the fast-paced changing world we all live in, I, I can never even fathom this notion of, we did it. You know, we are, we're programmatic experts. Like, it feels like it's all more channels are going to come on. And each of them, as we've talked about here, mobile, we're, we're getting over things like measurement problems or creative problems, or we're getting over that. So the next channel that's going to be coming in, television, what about those measurement things and, and how that's all going to work? It just seems like it's, it's a constant kind of um, desire to learn and grow and continue in that space. That's my instinct, too, that this is going to be perpetual chop, right? It's going to be rough waters, it's not going to always be smooth and easy, it's going to take a lot of, on. I mean, there's no putting the genie back in the bottle, right? It's, it's here. Um, but nor is there any sort of light at the end of the tunnel in a way. I mean, it just yeah. seems like, boy, this is going to be, I don't even know what that looks like in four years yeah. from now or five years, other than more change, constant, yeah. It'd constant change. be like, change. did it, surf the internet, I did it, yeah. I'm done. Exactly. <laughs> Got it all. Exactly. Yeah. I had a question over here. One more question. Okay. Questions for Julie. Um, being that programmatic is changing so quickly, how would you say today you guys are measuring success in the space? Is it click-throughs to the website, engagement? You mentioned you're finding a lot of new audiences. How do you know those audiences are working for you in the programmatic space? Yeah, our measurement for programmatic is not much different than our overall one and the challenges I mentioned that we have. So we are, and we have evolved it, because not too long ago we were just looking at behavioral metrics and um, that somehow were click reliant. And we all know you're more likely to get struck by lightning than you are to click on a banner. (laughs) So we wanted to evolve from that, and it was only recently that we added more attitudinal. And I know there's a lot of like, hey, every three months we decide, we do you know, dynamic logic studies or something like that. But um, we're working with Nielsen OBE to try to build in attitudinal optimization for, um, for what we're doing. And that's for us, and I'm, many of you may say, yeah, we've been doing that for a long time. But for us, that was part of our evolution of our measurement framework. And so we're applying those two things. Yes, it's, there are behavioral elements, but we want to think about attitudinal shifts too um, for all of our digital as well as programmatic. We have time for one more. Yeah, hey Tom, I have a question for you and sort of, you've been doing mobile a long time and you don't control marketing at Coca-Cola, so I think you're free to answer this question. Yeah, if you, if give, you say so. <laughs> given, 
given what you've seen and what you know, if you had a clean slate and you could make it non-Coca-Cola, what, what would you do now if you were in charge of media for a major corporation? It goes back to some of the things. I do have an answer for that, actually. I think it goes back to some of the things that I was talking about in my comments uh, to open this up, that you know, the reality is you can use your phone to buy a Coke. And I can't use my PC. I can't. Right, I can use. I would really love to understand and mark that first Coke we sold on mobile from creating awareness through to that transaction. And that's the golden disk. Right? And then what I want to do is do that a billion times, right? And not get distressed. That was my mobile only language, right? So let the rest of the company kind of do what they're going to do, but use programmatic because that's a really powerful tool to start chipping away costs because there's not a lot of money in that Coke, right? I can't spend a lot of advertising dollars uh, to drive the sale of one $2 Coke. So I have to start figuring out the role that all the cans, the bottles, how I leverage those assets, how I leverage those coolers to start filling the funnel, and only when I have to, all of which can be included in a programmatic concept in a way, right? Um, but when it's time to spend money, how do I leverage all the things that we're doing there to just, it's a, Coke is always going to be in the brand building business. That's, that's what we do. But you start getting a direct response mindset when you start having a conversation mm. around programmatic and the deal's done. You bought a Coke with your, with your phone. So that, I would build that machine that sold, build and scale the machine that sold that first Coke all on a mobile device. Great. Well, thank you, Julie. Your experience has been invaluable to share with this audience today. Thank um, you for having thank me. Thank you, Tom, sure. for joining from additional brand perspective. So. With that, I will Thank turn you. it over to Josh for housekeeping, but I think it's time for lunch. It is. Thanks, Thank all three of you. Thank you, Angela. How about that?